All right. Well, I think we're set, folks. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, Grant Walters, Director of Ed Programs here at the Akuhai Central Office. Greetings from Columbus. Hope everybody's doing well. Uh, thanks for joining us this afternoon, uh, or from wherever you happen to be from, whatever time of the day it is, welcome. Uh, so this afternoon, we're going to be tackling uh, an information and feedback session on the Housing and Residence Life Programs revisions to the CAS standards. Um, I get the privilege of sit sitting on the CAS Council with Alan Blattner. Uh, who is going to be your presenter for this afternoon. Uh, so we're doing a lot of this work, not just for housing and residence life, but also for other areas of student affairs too. So uh, Alan's going to share some of those revisions and from other areas too, just as they apply to us and uh, give you some information. Uh, we'll set aside some time that you'll be able to ask questions and provide some feedback as well. Um, over email, I sent you up the document that has the draft revisions. Um, if you, um, I will put a Google Doc link into the chat just in case you all didn't see that, uh, but it's there available for you to read. And so um, it might be harder to see on screen for some, uh, so you have it there, but I'll, I'll put it in the chat too in just a few minutes. Um, so we're recording right now. This will be available online afterwards for you or anybody else who'd like to see it. We also have closed captioning on. If you need to see that or would like to, uh, click on the live transcript button and click on the live transcript and show. Uh, I think it says show, um, oh, show transcript. There you go. So if, if it's not active, go ahead and do that. Um, but otherwise, without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Alan and uh, he's yours for the hour. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Grant. Appreciate it. Um, as Grant said, I'm Alan Blattner. I'm the executive director of Carolina Housing at uh, UNC Chapel Hill. Um, that's my day job, but as most of us know, we also have these night jobs when we volunteer with the Kuhoai and other professional associations. And currently, uh, for me, that is being uh, one of our two liaisons to the CAS Council. I'm very excited to have been doing that for the past couple of years and very excited that my term overlaps with the review of our standards. Um, and so I'm going to take a minute here and share my screen. Um, so we can walk through, can everybody see the, the slide deck? Perfect. Um, and so um, what we're going to do today after welcome introductions is I'll just go through a few things about CAS just to set the stage, um, an overview of the review process that we've been through up till this point, um, kind of a status check, and then kind of where we head from here. Um, a little bit about the CAS standards and guidelines because um, they are um, they take a little tutorial in order to be able to kind of fully understand the uh, kind of what the shoulds and mays and mights all mean. Um, and also there's a color coding scheme that goes along with all this. And so uh, I'll catch you up to speed on that. And then really we'll spend the lion's share of our time um, reviewing the current draft. Um, so hopefully you've had a chance to take a look at it, if not, and, and brought some questions. If you don't, um, we've got some areas where we made some um, um, some edits that we're still particularly looking for feedback on, um, and we'll we'll go through those and um, all that in the next hour. And uh, so uh, I appreciate everybody kind of kind of being with us. We had a great session this morning, um, and uh, really intentionally did it at two different times um, to hopefully capture some of our our international colleagues and partners. Uh, this morning, Best was able to join us from South Africa, so that was uh, outstanding. Um, hopefully, we'll. Uh, you know, continue to serve uh, that population well as, as, as we do our domestic folks. So again, thank you for joining us. Um, so in terms of CAS, um, you know, it is a council of now 41 member associations, um, started in 1979. Um, Akuai was one of the first founding members. Um, we had our own standards and as we have got together with NASPA and others, um, it just became very clear that uh, the profession of student affairs needed um, some standards, needed a way to kind of review and uh, share standards amongst, uh, amongst everyone concerned. And so uh, CAS was formed. Um, it continues to be comprised of representatives from all the member associations, uh, really focused on consensus and collaborative approach to developing the standards um, for the profession and then for the 47 sets of now functional area standards, housing residential programs is one of 47 standards. Um, and all of the standards come along with the self-assessment guide. Um, and the standards kind of articulate what it is that we, we strive to be. The self-assessment guide is a tool that, a, that an institution can use 
to judge and, and kind of hold itself up against those standards um, in terms of where are they meeting, where are they exceeding, and where do they have a little bit of uh, aspirant work to do in order to, uh, to achieve the, the standards. Very often that comes along with um, an external review um, or a, a process that the division is running in terms of annually or biannually reviewing um, all the departments within, uh, within the purview of student affairs. There are also now three cross-functional uh, cross frameworks for things that don't fit nicely into any one aspect of student affairs. Um, the first one that came out, and it makes a lot of sense when you, when you think about it, is first-year experience. No one owns the first-year experience. Orientation has a piece, housing has a piece, advising has a piece. Um, so it, it really is a, an opportunity uh, for CAS to offer the cross-functional framework for these, uh, for these areas that don't fit nicely into any one bucket. And what are those functional areas, you may ask? Well, here they are. Um, and so you can see many of the areas that are traditionally represented within student affairs portfolios and some that um, are outside um, are, are under the umbrella of the CAS functional areas at this point, um, of course, with our housing residential life one highlighted there in red. All of those standards uh, since 2018 um, have these same 12 elements to them. Um, and so the document you received is structured along these 12, uh, along these 12 frameworks. Um, that was new in 2018. Um, all, of the, um, all of the standards in 2018 went through a restructure. Even though they all weren't thoroughly reviewed, they were all restructured to go into this format. Um, and so uh, you can see in front of you what, how those uh, different pieces fit together. In terms of where we are in our review process, um, our standard was last adopted in, in 2013. Um, and as I mentioned in 2018, all of the general standards were reviewed and updated across all the functional areas. And so, uh, but really the last time that housing professionals dug deep into the CAS standards, uh, reviewing them um, was in 2013. Um, so we really, uh, whenever there's a review, have an opportunity to reflect back over the last eight years, but also to think ahead of how these standards will represent us and guide us for the next seven or so years, because they won't be reviewed again for a number of years. And so there's really an opportunity, and this is really the charge of everyone who's been involved in this process, is not only to bring us up to date on what we've missed over the past eight years, but to really look forward uh, and, and think about what are those emerging trends and how can we um, write these standards in such a way that they may actually um, lead us in that direction. The example I always use whenever I talk about this was, is telephones. You know, I remember how hard we worked in the early days to actually put phones in all the rooms, and then we went and yanked them all out. Um, obviously, the standards need to reflect that kind of um, change in, in our work world. Um, and, you know, that exists not only in the facility side of things, but clearly in the programmatic offerings, mental health would be one that has certainly become, uh, you know, a, a major thrust of a number of much of our work. Um, and then finally, the relationship between uh, the CAS standards and the AKUHAWAI standards. As I mentioned, AKUHAWAI has had its own standards um, as a professional association. And I think there are only four or five of the 41 um, umbrella and under CAS that still maintain their own standards. AKUHAWAI does it um, for a number of reasons. I think, first of all, historically, and um, you know, we, we like to have our own. It's, it's, a, it's a good way for us to represent our profession but also housing is unique in some ways that we encounter the opportunity to overlap with many of the other standards that are out there. So you will not see when you review the housing residence life standard, a lot of dining or a lot of conference and events, a lot of leadership development or a lot of conduct programs, things that our housing departments do a lot of, but you will not see those reflected deeply in the CAS housing and residence life program standards. We really rely on those other standards to guide us. The AKUOI standard begins to blend those in, in a more intentional and dynamic way. And so you'll see more things about 
dining and conference services and the other things that are very often umbrellaed under a housing um, portfolio in those uh, in, in the Akuho I standard. So that's part of the reason we maintain and part of the reason that those of us who do external reviews and self studies very often use both standards because they really do provide um, similar lenses, but different in, in some fairly important um, and helpful ways. So that's just a little bit about why there is still two standards and, and how they fit together. The structure of the review process that has gone on um, really for the past uh, nine months um, started with a committee of, of cast members. Every standard, when it comes up for review every seven or eight years, has a, a, a group of cast member uh, associations that come together to review it. It starts with the appointment of a chair um, by, the, by the executive board. Um, we were lucky enough uh, that Ray Plaza, um, who many of you may know um, from his time in, in, in housing and residence life. Um, he now is at Santa Clara doing um, DEI work um, in, in, in their office there, but he's the ACPA representative to, um, to CAS and uh, was voluntold, actually, he volunteered um, to, uh, to step forward and serve as chair of this group and has done a fantastic job. There's also a functional area expert, typically the association rep, and that's been me serving on this committee, kind of representing us, the profession, and our group of, of, of experts that we pulled together. Um, within CAS, there is a, a group called the Standards Management Committee, and their job is to make sure that all the standards remain relatively consistent, that they meet the standards in terms of shoulds and musts. And this will all make a little bit more sense in a, in a minute when I describe the structure, but their job is kind of the keeper of the standards from the big picture perspective to make sure that they all look and feel similar if they're gonna be under the CAS umbrella. So there's members of that group that are a part of each one of these committees. And then other council members will, will sign on um, and uh, we are also expected as council members to sign on to others. I was part of the, uh, um, the review for the um, student conduct uh, process last year. So we all serve in different ways. So that's within the CAS umbrella. Then the professional association most closely associated with the um, standard that is up for review is asked to come up with a committee of what's called an external experts. And so Akuhawai did that. Um, we did an open call of our members. Many of you may remember that that went out. Um, and we also tapped leadership from key committees. It makes total sense that the chair of the Akuhawai Standards Committee would join in this process. Um, and indeed, uh, many members from that committee have signed on, um, as well as um, key initiatives within the, um, within the association. Um, that we wanted to make sure that we had representatives from the racism task force join this to make sure that the, that the standards were following along with some of the conversations that were hap happening in the anti-racism task force to make sure that, uh, that that all remains aligned. So that happened, that group has been serving us well, um, providing insight and perspective into each one of the um, changes that have been made in the standards. Um, we divided that group into uh, subgroups, um, each led by a member of the CAS uh, committee that I talked about, um, and really a deep dive into um, reviewing each and every standard, proposing new language, proposing new standards, and, and, and really coming out the other side with the document that, that has been shared with you. Um, this group really has done a nice job of, first of all, being diverse in terms of where we pulled them from. There was small school, large school, um, HBCUs, uh, you know, people who were sitting directors, people who were in the assessment world, people who were practitioners um, of various, uh, in various elements of housing, uh, the housing world. Um, and so they really have done a nice job representing the association and helping us to, to craft the document uh, into what I believe is a, is a really, um, really a good start to where we need to end up. Um, and then um, they really uh, have also, again, taken on that charge I mentioned before of not only making sure it's relevant for today, but also relevant for, for our future. 
The timetable that we've been on, uh, we started back in January with convening all these committees, um, got the review process really rolling from March until July. Um, in August, um, we finalized the initial draft and sent it to that, um, that management committee I talked about. They went ahead and made sure that it met all the brand standards forecasts. Um, and that's essentially where we are now, the draft that you've seen before you. Um, we're now taking it back out to select groups. Um, uh, we went to and had a session at ACE this year where we got some initial feedback that's already been incorporated um, coming to this group. Ray will be talking to um, ACPA's commission um, on housing and residential education. They've had a group that has been looking at this with us. And so really trying to get as many different eyes um, looking at this as we can. Um, all that will wrap up by September 30th when we will present this to the CAS membership board um, in total. Um, and that leads then to the November meeting of CAS where uh, there will be an up or down vote as to whether or not this is the new standard uh, for housing and residential programs for CAS. Um, so we are on track um, to be able to have this ready um, for members to use in either late 2021 or early 2022. Um, let me also say that at the same time that our review is going on, um, this is the year that the CAS general standards are being reviewed. And so let me first talk about the structure of CAS and then I can talk about why that's important to us. But let me first stop by and ask if, if there are any questions uh, that people have so far and Grant, I know you're managing the chat. Is there anything that's come in there? Nothing yet, no. All right. We're a small enough group that uh, please just go ahead and unmute and, and, and pipe in if you should have anything uh, um, and uh, we'll take it from there. So uh, CAS divides its, its, its documents into two things, standards and guidelines. Standards are the indispensable requirements required by um, by CAS to be um, uh, the, the most well-developed program that you could be a, as a housing and residence life entity. Um, when you look at the document, they all appear in bold and they use words like must and shall. Um, guidelines are really in there to help clarify and amplify the standards um, and use the words should and may. So obviously a uh, very different direction um, in terms of something you must do versus something you may do. Um, they appear in, in, light, in light face type. They are very often put into after a standard, there will be a guideline to begin to give readers and users a little flavor of what it is that we mean by this. For example, um, you know, something as simple as um, you, know, you, you must, have a mission statement. Doesn't need a lot of clarification. That's pretty clear as to what an organization should do. But if they say they must train staff on key elements of necessary to do their work, that needs a little bit of, little bit of breaking out into what that might mean on, a, on an institutional level. The problem and the tension always with staff, with CAS and our standards is we know we're writing these for big schools, small schools, folks across the whole globe potentially, well-resourced versus under-resourced. Um, they, they really need to speak to the entire profession and the entire group that is, that is uh, kind of trying to adopt these as our standards. So we have to be very careful about how we use and when we use musts and when we use shoulds. Um, uh, because every group will try and determine in its own way, given its own resources and its own culture, how they are going to achieve these standards. And so um, that's where, uh, you know, we really get into really trying to be very, very careful in terms of how we, how we use these. Um, so for example here, um, you know, a general standard um, programs and services must develop their mission. Um, that is in blue and in bold. The difference between the, the text in blue and the text in, in black, the text in blue is a standard that exists across all 47 of CAS's functional frameworks. Um, and so 
for our committee, those are unchangeable. Um, we are not able to change the things in blue because that is consistent across all CAS um, and across all CAS standards. Now, I talked about that this is a unique year that our revision is coming up at the same time as this language in blue is being reviewed across all the, um, across all the standards. Uh, Gavin Henning, for those of you who know him, former CAS president, faculty member uh, at New England College is leading that effort. Um, and what they are doing is they're taking all the feedback that has come from all the reviews of the standards over the past eight years, committees are asked to, while they can't make changes, they are asked to suggest changes. It goes into what we kind of colloquial call the bank of casts, um, and it gets put there for when the general standard is reviewed again. So we had lots of feedback about the stuff in blue, and we have provided that to casts. It will be baked together with all the other feedback and we will see a new set of general standards come out within the year. Um, the standards in black are the ones that our committees have been polishing, revising, and really digging into. So that's the difference as we start to look at this document. And then finally, the stuff that is not in bold um, are the guidelines. And all of those are um, up for interpretation and review um, for this group and, and others. So that can, be, that can be a little confusing, but if we look at the document itself, the stuff in blue we can't change, the stuff in black, whether it's in bold or in um, non-bold, is up for our, um, our interpretation and our ability to, uh, to wordsmith. All right, so there's, there's my presentation part. Um, let's start with, are there any questions before we dive into what I hope is the meat of, of today, um, kind of reviewing our, uh, our current work. All right, seeing none, we will go ahead and, and, and just and dive in. So I'm going to switch screens here and go to the document that was sent to you. Give me just a second here. Okay, um, and again, uh, I want to start with any questions, thoughts, ideas this group has. Um, if not, I will dive into a couple areas that um, that Cass has identified that we want some some further feedback and work on, and and we can we can um, have a dialogue about those. But I want to start by um, pausing and seeing if there's anything out there from the good of the group from your quick read of uh, of what's going on so far um, and. Uh, so we'll stop there. Anything you all have as an initial kicking off point? Alan, just really quickly, there was a question in the chat from Nikki asking if we're planning on conducting CAS standards in the spring, should we hold off until these updates are approved? Um, that's a great question. Um, given what I have seen happen, and this has, I mean, obviously if you can wait, it would be great, but I have seen this trajectory of approval um, slow down from time to time. We actually have four standards that will be up for um, approval at the November meeting. Then they have to go to branding and be in court, you know, so, and so that may take, we want them out in early 2022, but that may be optimistic. And so I'd hate for someone who, um, you know, is trying to keep on a cycle um, to, to miss out on an opportunity. Um, but uh, if you want to check back with me, I would be happy to give you a status check after that November meeting for what they are saying at that point um, is the, the current ETA of the delivery of these. Um, so that's kind of a non-answer answer. answer. Um, but uh, I would hate for someone to slow their process up thinking that these were going to be up and then for there to be an internal CAS issue that delays their, their release. Great question. In your initial kind of uh, you know tinkering and looking at the document that was sent out not too long ago, was there anything that, uh, that jumped off the page in terms of a, a starting point that we'd like to, to start with? All right, 
then we'll jump into Alan's ideas, and uh, you all can, uh, you all can, uh, if, if, if we have ideas as we go along, please uh, continue to bring those out. The first is, and uh, you know, you'll notice still a few things in pink um, in, in the document, and those are kind of some of the last minute tweaks and changes that are going on. Um, but in particular, this, this paragraph that's on the screen um, really comes out of two different pieces of feedback that we heard loud and clear through all the review processes. One was mental health continues to be an issue that we, um, that we grapple with in housing and residential programs for how we manage it, who manages it, um, putting the right level of staffing behind response and, and all those kinds of things. At the same time, over the past 18 months, we certainly have had a national conversation about the appropriate role or inappropriate role of police and their interventions in mental health spaces. Um, and so um, this is an attempt to try and give voice to those two things that are going on, but not be, CAS never really wants to be too incredibly directive um, in terms of it really wants to try and tell institutions this is something you should be thinking about. And in this case, evaluating policy and procedure about, um, and then we'll very often put some context to um, you know, the, the issue that it's trying to, to kind of enunciate. So in here, knowing that we've got incident response uh, needs um, and how do we complement or replace law enforcement when not needed, um, and then lists out a number of, of situations. In the last group, uh, they've already suggested that we take out or change around the order of other non-emergency because if you read this in one way, it can make it look like we're calling mental health reports of sexual violence and sexual harassment, like we're calling them non-emergencies. I think it was meant to say, don't just look at the emergencies, look at the non-emergencies as well. Um, so we've already got a recommendation to kind of restructure it in that way. Um, but we'd love any kind of thoughts that people have about how this would resonate with you and your, um, and your organizations and whether this would be clear in what we're kind of asking or would, uh, would it cause you problems? Would it, uh, is it helpful? So I'll stop there and, and, and let anyone kind of jump in. Is there another place where work with law enforcement is or is identified or articulated? The um, there, there is a communication and um, collaboration section. That's one of the standard um, blocks and, and, and it is listed in there amongst many um, that is suggested uh, that there be relationships between housing and residence life and fill in the blank. So it's, it's, it's enumerated there. I'm thinking through the lens of uh, responding to bias. You know, that's not necessarily named in those lines, but responding mm -hmm. to bias and the ways in which housing and residence life may partner with public safety as a first responder in situations of bias. Yeah, yeah, that would certainly be a good one to add to that tick list there. You know, along with those things, bias incidents. Yep. Any other thoughts on this one in particular? Okay. Well, if you think of them, come on back. Um, let me go to the next one that, um, we did an incredible amount of editing, as you may imagine, to, let me get down to it, number five. Alan, sorry, just one second. I just noticed a question pop up in the chat um, sure. from Carol. She doesn't have a, a camera or mic to, to participate. So she oh, said, you, yeah, so would training for police law enforcement fall under policies and procedures? I'm sorry, would what? Would training for police and law enforcement fall under policies and procedures? I think it would in this case, um, because there's a whole standard um, that ICLEA helped us work on, and actually it was just redone last year, um, for what 
police training. So it wouldn't be appropriate necessarily for us to call out in, in the housing standard, but it, it, it absolutely would be if that's part of your institutional, um, of how your institution would work, that housing staff would train new law enforcement agent, you know, uh, officers on a campus or that there's some housing um, orientation for them. I know many campuses do that or that before we put them before RAs, we have a conversation about you know, how, how we structure that. So yeah, that would absolutely be part of, of that. Okay. Um, we, we did significant rewrites to, uh, to part five, which is uh, access, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, and there's a couple in here I wanted to um, highlight. Um, let me find it here. <laughs> Alan, one more question just came yeah. in. Um, does the incident response section account for student staff members as well as professional staff? That's a great point. Um, and I'm going to make a note that maybe that should be a play. Very often we enumerate when we want it to count for both. We say both, um, and, but I'm not sure we're 100% consistent on that, but that probably is one um, where we, where we want to call that out. So this one highlighted in blue here uh, on the screen, um, the HRLP must investigate, question the norms, formal and informal rules, routine procedures, behaviors that are rewarded in or, uh, or punished interaction patterns and language systems that create organizational culture. <clears throat> we were, <clears throat> I'm not I, well, I'm pretty sure we don't have that one right yet um, because I think it's a fairly <clears throat> confusing um, notion. What we, and what came out of the last group is they suggested that we move organizational culture early in the sentence because that's really what we're talking about. <clears throat> that they continue to assess or investigate the organizational culture in the way that norms are formed, informal and formal rules are, um, are brought forward, procedures, what's rewarded and punished. It really is a, a call to continue to examine our culture um, around these important topics and then how it sits within the the organization's um, DEI work. Um, so I'm interested in people's reactions to that um, or thoughts on how that could be made more clear or explicit. Hey, Alan, um, yeah. well, why the terminology punished? Yeah, that was a, a long debate, as you might imagine. Um, and it was, it was, it, it came from the, the group that reviewed the, uh, this standard and they really felt that it was Im important to call that out in particular because there are some things that are rewarded and there are some things that by calling it out, there may be formal or informal punishment by spotlighting something that, uh, that the department may or may not want um, drawn attention to whether that's a particular practice, whether it's a particular outcome of a, of, of a, of a procedure. Um, so it, uh, they really wanted to, and, and, and cause the, uh, the, the, the cast group pushed back on that a little bit. And when they, when they came back, they really felt it was important. Um, so that's the context to that. Just for a point of note, I take issue with uh, the terminology punished, uh, especially if we're uh, in this, this mode of uh, educating yeah. uh, the students that we work with, uh, educating the student staff that we work with, and is punished the appropriate terminology to use. Given my explanation of the concept would you would you have an offering for a replacement word or um, is is the whole notion that we're trying to identify places where people are 
and because I guess it would be inappropriately punished. I mean, that's really what we're trying to identify is okay. places where people are are called out where they shouldn't be or where they're put in the political doghouse for simply raising awareness of an issue that is not popular. I, I, I definitely like what Jill recommended, which would be consequences. Okay. Well, because I think consequences can mean a bunch of different things. Um, you know, I think when we're always talking with students, we want to assess risk, you know, assess consequences and allow them to make kind of that decision. And some of those will be quote unquote punishments. Yeah. But to me, that's a more constructive word. Yeah. Yeah. In particular, I mean, it, it, you're all bringing a student staff lens to it, which is a really interesting let the, when, when it was created, it was really, they were, they were worried about professional staff being punished for within the context of their roles, feeling like they couldn't step forward and, and call out their departments to be, to be better. Um, but it's an, in, it's a, it, it does also apply as all the standards do to all staff. So that's a really important distinction. I, yes. I would like to nuance moving away from punishment to consequences. Consequences is a neutral word. Consequences can be both positive and negative. Um, it's just an outcome for behavior. Uh, actual antonym language for reward is punishment That's or some form of retribution. And I don't want to diminish the experience of folk who have a extremely negative response um, when they challenge norms, rules and procedures that should be investigated or questioned. So if we're not going to use punish, I think we do need to acknowledge and choose language that acknowledges what folk experience from that is indeed an opposite of reward and is some form of penalty. That says it better than I did. That's exactly what the committee was trying to articulate. Thank you. Okay, any other comments on that? How about any other, those were the, the, the two that we really were, were interested in more feedback on. Um, are there other things maybe that you're wondering, are they in the standards or how does the standards address? And we can, we can take a look at those sections um, or I can at least take some notes to make sure that I bring it back to the committee to make sure that, um, that we're, that we're covering the watershed with this, uh, with this revision and making sure it's as current as it needs to be. Um, so maybe for those of you who have used the standards in the past, um, you know, were, th were there some things you found lacking um, um, as you think about the work that we're doing and the, and the ever-changing nature? Um, you know, are there some things that, that you wanna, wanna call specific attention to? Let me, let me say while you think on that, um, that we, we're very cognizant of we were doing this during a pandemic and we didn't want you to be able to tell that it was written during a pandemic. For example, you know, people were saying, <clears throat> well, should we, you know, should isolation and quarantine be in there in terms of, and it's like, first of all, boy, I hope not um, because I want to get out of that business as soon as I can. But the broader concept there would be emergency procedures or flexible housing to accommodate ongoing needs. So you won't see hopefully notions of pure pandemic language, but you will see that certainly the, uh, the time at which it was written, there's no, there's no getting away from the impact of the pandemic that it had an impact on our thinking, but we tried to broaden it appropriately so that it was, it was able to guide us through all the different things that may come our way as we, as we wind our way through the next uh, seven or eight years. So there, I gave you some time to think. Anybody else got uh, something you have a question about? Okay. Let me then, um, take us in a, in a different direction. Um, one of the other things that um, Akuhai and CAS are tasked with is trying to make sure that once these standards are approved, 
they're as useful as possible to, to the profession. And so i um, wondering if we might be able to have a discussion, uh, if you've been a user of the standards, how you've used them, um, and if not, what, what we could do to make them useful, um, if it's purely an availability question, if it's, a, if it's a time or expertise question, do we need sessions at ACE? We certainly have the Standards Institute um, you know, that will um, you know, be a deep dive into not only how to use the ACUI, but the CAS standards. Um, what is it that has been helpful in the past for those of you who have used them? Um, and for those of you who haven't, um, if you can think of what, what may be an overcomable barrier that we could be of assistance with as we think about the relaunch of these standards, because that's really our, our best opportunity. When, we, when it's fresh and new, people will pay attention to the new standards. And so how do we at that, at that moment also kind of implore people and get rid of the barriers to their use? Alan, I would say uh, you, you touched on uh, ACE hosting uh, a session on it. Maybe it's not necessarily ACE, but a separate workshop where it focuses yes. solely on this. You know, we often run into competing interests uh, at, the, at the conference. I think the other piece is uh, we haven't used them here, but we're in the process of strategic planning. So I'd be curious to learn how people have used that in their strategic planning, in their um, reshaping of job descriptions, uh, things of that nature. Sure. One of the things we're excited to launch, and I'm hoping it'll come out right about the same time as, um, <clears throat> as the new standards, we did uh, a white paper on four, uh, four institutions and how they had used the standards in their, in their planning. Um, whether it was an external review or your strategic planning or those kind of things. And so I'm hoping we can launch those and maybe that a conversation around those, maybe even, uh, you know, I just thought, you know, maybe a, a round table featuring those institutions where people could ask questions after having read their case statements. Um, you know, maybe there's an, uh, you know, Mary just popped in and I know University of Buffalo is one of those. So uh, I was going to be like, I was in the middle of something, but uh, yeah, UB, University of Buffalo, we did do um, a departmental division-wide review, um, continuing, actually, we're using the CAS standards for every single office within our division, um, and I think the one thing that I, I, it took some time as a, you know, when you read the standards to understand kind of how to utilize them, and I think for the one thing that I would say is maybe looking at um, how, is, how is breaking it down so you can um, include um, as many people as you can, but utilizing language that is universal to anybody who um, would be looking at those standards. Um, so you're not spending as much time trying to explain to either a student group or, you know, if you're working with your custodial staff members or whoever that may be, um, so that they can understand what, um, what is needed. And there's also, if we found, I mean, I found for our school, for there was a lot of repetition in, in, certain, in certain areas. And so figuring out, like, is there a way to make it so that there isn't as much repetition happening within each of those sections? But I also think that that is, some of those are on a CAS level and not necessarily right. the specific housing residence life level. Yeah, that's a good point. Alan, this is Alan Norick, and I would echo very much what Mary just said, because we just went through doing the internal stuff uh, last spring over the summer. It's all kind of a blur, but the same thing, I found myself having to tell people, Yes, this is very similar to this section, but here's where it's a little different um, because the language did throw people off. We're like, didn't we already talk about this? Did when that already measured over there? Um, and the other thing that, um, especially when we take it to the student level, when we talk about housing and residential life program, they think programs um, and because of our history and our lingo and what the culture we've created um, yeah. around what, when we use the word programs, what automatically is drawn to that versus the department. Yeah. Um, and I found myself repeatedly have to explain, no, this isn't, we're not evaluating our, 
programs, we're evaluating our operation right. um, as a unit. Um, so that language still tricks yep. people up. I, I would say that language even tricks up our, 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 our any of our staff. So we've taken to saying not program with a small P, yeah. like programs, but program with a capital P. Yep. So it's like the whole, the whole, the big area. And I know that's been a topic of conversation in CAS, you know, even the, the title of this whole thing is, you know, housing residents like program, it could be operations, um, you know, and, and that could be true, you know, really across the titles of all of the, um, say, I know that's in the bank of CAS to be considered um, because it does get in the way. Um, and Mary, I've used that same small P, capital P language, you know, I'm not talking about the time management program for 30 people. I'm talking about the the residential learning program for all first year students. You know, it's just, and they're on different scales and scopes. So absolutely. How about others of you that have either used them um, or uh, for whom uh, using them has been a, a goal, but maybe you haven't gotten there yet um, and, and what we may be able to do to, to be helpful in that space. Okay, the last thing um, that's on our minds um, coming up in the near future um, is a review of um, the alcohol programs um, standard. And obviously that has a lot of overlap with the work that we do. Um, and so, uh, and, and, and other drugs are also incorporated in there. And so there's obviously some unique challenges going on. Um, on the alcohol side, um, how we incorporate the movement that we've seen across many campuses um, in recovery and the responsibilities that many institutions have had with recovery houses, recovery floors and programs and, and those types of services. So I'd be interested in any thoughts you have about that. Um, and then obviously on the other drug side in particular with marijuana, um, you know, back when these standards were last reviewed, um, marijuana was still illegal in all states. It is now, all over the map um, and um, even more widely um, differential uh, than the laws are people's perceptions of what we should be doing um, to enforce them, not enforce them, allow it on campus, don't allow it on campus. Um, and so I would just open up, uh, you know, I, I likely will, will volunteer uh, to be on this group. And so just wanted to take an opportunity um, while I had a a, a group together to think about, um, are there any suggestions as you think about how your campus has, has done with this, that what kind of standards would be helpful or what kind of thinking we should be um, imploring as we think about redoing that standard in particular? Does anyone have recovery programs on their campuses that they're doing? And are they residential or are they non-residential? If you don't mind sharing a little bit. So the University of Dayton has a Center for Alcohol, Drug and Resources Education Office that runs the recovery program. Um, and so it's not run out of housing and residence life, but through what we affectionately call cadre. Um, but uh, they train our staff on recovery programming or recovery uh, language and how to be a, a person who is inclusive of someone who is in recovery. So that's a part of our, okay. our piece. Um, however, as, you, as a part of the alcohol, from a lens of a housing and residence life staff person, if you look on YouTube at the University of Dayton, um, you'll find our Saturday day drinks or you'll find our large gatherings. And, yep. and one of our challenges is thinking about how to address those. And I asked the question about police earlier also because a Saturday day drink is not a police matter. Mm. It's a student development matter. And the police have made, our, our police work for our division. Um, but they've been very clear that it's not their, it's not a police matter. And so how do we navigate yeah. the management of that? And so it's crossing over alcohol, but also crossing over. Role of police. And mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. 
yeah, uh, that, I am sure the role of police will come up early and often in that discussion, you know, because it, yes, it's a, you know, a staff matter. It's a matter of student development, but it's also, at least for our under 21 year old friends, a, a legal matter. Um, and how do we, how do we wrestle with that? And then it's also, as it always is, a political matter, especially on, at least on this campus, on game days um, and uh, other such, uh, such events. So that's a great point. Thank you. And it, we, we do yeah. have residential recovery housing at Ohio State. We also have a recovery community as well that's non-residential. Okay. Um, it's a house that is facilitated um, by a team of folks out of our wellness center. So it is part of our housing system in terms of how students show up to be there. And um, we have a housing coordinator who see, oversees that along with some other unique properties, but the staff that are day-to-day -day in there doing the operations are connected to our wellness center. Okay. Um, Connected with some of the other alcohol related things, I would say for our campus, one of the things that we in Residence Life wrestle with a lot is um, just the idea of what sanctions are being mandated for students and whether there's costs associated with those at different levels. And so that's one of the things I think we're challenged with is we have a pretty robust wellness center, but I think some of those positions are actually funded by okay. charging students to participate in those, um, those interventions. Yeah, and we've just developed, at least for the off-campus students, um, a, a diversion program. So instead of a ticket, um, they get they get sent to uh, you know a, a program at the town. They're charged for that. Um, we're trying to figure out how residentially we do that so that we don't really have a huge differential between what happens off-campus and on-campus because that's never good. Um, so that's that's a great point. Thank you for that. How about on the marijuana side? Um, any anybody, especially from states where it has become legal, anything that the standards can do to to be of assistance in in guiding the thought process that you and your colleagues have had to do in terms of developing policy. I know many campuses are simply covered under their smoking policy and say smoking, no matter what you're smoking, um, not okay. Um, but I'm uh, I'm not sure that's uh, carrying the day everywhere. So uh, anyone? I mean, is it medical is legal in Missouri, but because we are a public institution receiving federal funds, it is not legal no matter what. And so that is the constant battle in terms of that education of the difference between a public law and university slash federal government practices. Um, and that I don't it's just been going away anytime soon until something can change on the federal level. And that is um, a, a key issue that we've got to make sure people know they've got to clearly define that, that message because our, our students, even with their, their medical card, they cannot use that prescribed marijuana anywhere on campus. Uh, and, and that includes they can't even go into their car in the parking lot to take their prescription. Uh, they have to drive across the street to do that. Interesting. Yeah, that's a great point. And I could really see a, a standard that addressed when there's a conflict between state law and federal law, you know, that the institution should or must have a, you know, a a reconciliation of those two things, you know, just to really kind of force campuses, not that you all haven't been forced, but to reinforce in the standards, the conversation that has been propelled on campuses in order to, to reconcile those differences. Because that way, when the federal law, if and when it would change, um, the standard would guide how that, uh, how that conversation take place. And so that may be a really, uh, a really good one to put in there. Thank you. For framing it that way. All right, in our last five minutes, is there anything else that you want to say about the CAS standards or our alcohol standards or what we can do to help make these more accessible to you? Um, I know that you just got them earlier today and would would uh, uh, will put in the chat um, my uh, my email address. Um, and would encourage you as you, you know, 
have a little insomnia one night and, uh, you know, are looking for something to read, um, you know, always cast standards, always make a good read. Um, and uh, so pick that up. And if you have any thoughts on that, again, we have until, you know, it'll be September 30th when we will um, present this to the cast board. After that, um, we'll have probably another 15 or so days where we'll be incorporating that feedback along with any of the last feedback from these sessions. So we still have time. Um, and so as you have the, the chance to think about that, um, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and let me get the email in there because I can't type and talk at the same time. I'm not that good. Um, and, uh, you know, we'd love to ha have any feedback you have. Um, uh, and in terms of this document, um, you know, you're welcome to share it loosely with others. It's clearly, uh, you know, a, a public document, but I would just be really careful given that it's not the final document that people not confuse that because there still will be, um, you know, potential changes in there. Um, and we just hate for, for people to kind of uh, misread what this document is. It, it is indeed a near final draft, but, but we're not across the finish line yet. So, um, so with that, any last comments, questions, thoughts? All right. Uh, well, I hope it's been helpful. Thank you, Terrence, for that. Um, and uh, the recording will be available soon, Grant. Is that how that works? Okay. Yeah, about 24, 48 hours. We'll, okay. we'll have that up and ready to go. Um, um, and yep. again, would welcome further feedback uh, as, as you have it. So back to you, Grant. Yeah, thanks everybody. Well, we really appreciate you attending this afternoon. Uh, Alan mentioned that we're going through a simultaneous process in uh, Aku Hawaii for revising our core competencies and professional standards. I know Paul is helping us out with that work eventually too, and, and many other folks um, who have been participating. Um, it's a slow moving process just because we're uh, taking everything down to the studs and working back up again. Uh, so it's probably gonna happen over the next year and a half or two years or so, uh, but there'll be some opportunities for this group um, and others to provide feedback and sort of our progress as we go to. So um, that will, we value that very much when the time comes and we'll keep you posted on when that's going to be available. Great. Thanks, Thanks everybody. See ya. Cheers.